Hello, I'm Dr. Zheng Yi from China. I'm the Vice Director of Beijing Ending Hospital, Capital Medical University. My topic here today is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, also known as ADHD, which is a abbreviation of Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. My brief introduction to ADHD will mainly focus on the concept and the clinical aspects of the disorder, most of which is based on the Yakapapa textbook. As you know, ADHD is listed under neurodevelopmental disorders in DSM-5. It often starts in childhood with the behaviors of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity, which we will go into detail later. To meet the diagnostic criteria, the symptoms of ADHD must present in at least two separate settings, for example, both at home and in school. ADHD often causes functional impairment and is associated with abnormal neuropsychological functioning and neurobiological correlatives. Many researches now focus on the neurobiological basis of ADHD, preferential uh, cortex and uh, executive functioning impairment are among the well-researched areas. ADHD is not modern disease, and the concept of ADHD is uh, evolving over time. It's first described by H. Hoffman in 1854, as impulsive insanity and defective inhibition. Later in the 1900s, the hyperkinetic symptoms of ADHD is recognized. And in 1937, Bradley tried to treat this condition using the Benzodrine. But the historic conception of ADHD also labeled this disorder as one well, a fact children is responsible for not being able to control their behaviors. In 1920-1960, ADHD has been given the name minimal brain damage and minimal brain dysfunction, implicating a biological basis to this disorder. The modern era of ADHD begins when in the 1980s. Both the hyperkinetic symptoms and the inattention symptoms are emphasized in DSM-3. In the recent update of the DSM-5, ADHD is listed and neurodevelopmental disorders under the concept of adult, adult ADHD is also being recognized. The prevalence of ADHD is generally estimated as 5% for children under 18, and it might be higher among the school-aged children, and it affects boys more than girls. The question of ADHD is a culture-dependent disease is of some debate. The poor prevalence according to the demographic and the geographic location varies significantly. But the factors affecting prevalence studies are complicated, and it seems the diagnostic criteria used and whether impairment is included in the diagnostic criteria is the most important factors. The etiology of ADHD is still undetermined. ADHD is a familiar disorder with a strong genetic component. The heritability has been estimated at 76%, one of the highest among the mental disorders. But still now, no single candidate gene can explain the disorder. The disorder probably emerges from the interaction between genetic and the environmental factors. Among the environmental factors, prematurity, intrauterine explorer to tobacco, and lower birth weight 
is most constantly associated with ADHD. The clinical presentation of ADHD includes three categories of core symptoms, named inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. Inattention is present as difficult when initiating, remaining engaged in, and complicating a task. Hyperactivity is a excessive physical activity or constant feeling of restlessness. Impulsivity is a, the need for immediately gratification and act without thinking. The presentation of core symptoms may vary with age and manifest differently in different settings. For example, inattention may manifest as a short play sequence in younger children, but as disorganized and easily distracted by environmental in school-aged children, which may lead to poor school performance. The diagnosis of ADHD is made clinically, and there is no objective tests and label criteria. The detailed diagnostic criteria can be found either in DSM-5 or in ICD-10. There are several things we need to take into consideration when making the diagnosis of ADHD. First, we have to note the child past medical history and exclude other possible medical causes of the symptoms like seizure. The family environmental should be assessed for possible abuse or neglect. The child's developmental stage, as well as the symptoms' pervasiveness, should be taken into account. Finally, whether there is a clinical significantly impairment in social, academic, or occupational settings should be determined. The DSM and ICD are the two major diagnostic systems. For child and adolescent mental disorders, the diagnostic criteria for ADHD vary between these two systems. Some of the differences are worth nothing. The up-to-date versions of DSM and ICD are DSM-5 and ICD-10, respectively. The DSM listed the core symptoms of irritation and hyperactivity or impulsivity as all. Well, ICD needs the core symptoms for all three categories to present. The age of onset is before seven years of age in both DSM-4 and ICD-10. But it's raised to before 12 years of age in DSM-5. Because the diagnosis of ADHD is made merely by clinical observation, I would like to go into detail about the core symptoms of ADHD as listed in DSM-5. The symptoms of inattention include the child often fails to give close attention to details or makes careless mistakes in schoolwork, at work, or with other activities. Often has trouble holding attention on tasks or play activities. Often does not seem to listen when spoken to directly. Often doesn't follow through on instructions and fails to finish schoolwork, chores, and duties in the workplace. For example, loss function and sight checked it. Often has trouble organizing the tasks and activities. Often avoid dislikes or is reluctant to do tasks that require mental effort over a long period of time, such as school work or homework. Often loses things necessary for 
tasks and activities. For example, school materials, pencils, books, tools, wallets, keys, paperwork, eye glasses, mobile phones. The child is also often easily distracted and forgetful in daily activities. The symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity include that the child often fidgets with or taps hands or feet or squirms in seat, often leaves seat in situations when remaining seated is expected, often runs about or clamp in situation where it is not appropriate. Adolescents or adults may be limited to feeling restless, often unable to play or take part in leisure activities quietly, is often on the go, acting as if driven by a motor, often talks excessively, often blows out an answer before a question has been completed, often has trouble waiting the turn, often instructs or intrudes on others, for example, but into conversations or games. Growing evidence indicates that ADHD is a chronic disorder, and the symptoms often persistent into adult life. Patients with more several symptoms and combined type ADHD are at highest risk for persistence in adult life. ADHD affects all aspects of the patient's life and often result in several functional impairment. For school-aged children, they may have academic problems and difficulty in school interactions that may result in result in self-esteem issues. For old children and adolescents, apart from academic problems, ADHD may lead to smoking, substance abuse, injury, and legal issues. For adults, occupational failure, relationship problems, and legal issues may stem from ADHD. Because of the dire consequences of ADHD, treatment is often needed. The goal of treatment should be thinking improvement in all settings, including ADHD symptoms, cognitive deficits, academic performance, family problems, and the combined conditions Automodal interventions with different treatment targets are optimal. The treatment of ADHD can be divided into pharmacological treatment and non-pharmacological treatment. The first line medication is stimulate, which includes mesophindate, dextromethorphindate, dextroamphetamine and the mixture amphetamine source. The formula can be short-acting, long-acting, and sustained release patches. Stimulate should be given in lower dose first, and uh, titrate to optimal dose. The mild dose depend the transitory adverse effects of stimulants includes insomnia, headache, irritability, agitation, tremor, and loss of appetite and weight loss. The use of stimulants is also associated with exacerbation of tics, psychotic, and manic symptoms and seizures. It may reduce final adult height, but the growth typically resumes once the 
drug is stopped, it should be noted that all stimulate have potential for abuse. Other non-stimulant drugs include atomocytin, extended release quenfacin, and extended release clonidine. These drugs are considered second line treatment in case of uh, intolerance, contraindications, or treatment failures. All patients and families should be educated about the nature and the clinical causes of the diagnosed disorder to enhance its treatment. The no pharmacological treatment option for ADHD mainly refer to behavioral therapy, which focuses on identifying behavioral problems and stop reinforcing and wanted behaviors. Behavior therapy also include parent behavior training, other possible treatment options, including acupuncture, meditation, homeopathy, music therapy, whose effectiveness is not proven. proven. Now let's end this MOOC lecture. Thank you for your attention.